So if statements are one of the most useful things in computer programming, it's a way to branch your code so that under some conditions your code might do one thing and other other conditions it might do something different. So it's a way to uh, send your code in different directions based on uh, based on input. Long and short of it. So I'll kind of start off talking generally about what goes into an if statement. I'm also going to go through sort of a non-programming type of example just to kind of give you a conceptual understanding of what these do. So every if statement is going to start with the word if. That's the name. Then we're going to check a condition. If that condition is true, then we're going to do some kind of activity. Every if statement ends with end. Let's do a little non-programming uh, example. We'll use this kind of syntax, though. So I'll kind of set the stage here. Let's say I'm driving down the road, and I see parked on the side of the road a taco truck. And it's one that I know is a good one. Safe. A from the health department. So I'm going to ask myself when I see this taco truck, am I hungry? So if I am hungry, so if I'm hungry, I'm going to stop at this taco truck and I'm going to eat something. Okay, so if I see the taco truck and I ask myself if I'm hungry and the answer is no, I'm not actually hungry, then I'm probably not going to stop at the taco truck. Unless it's a really good one, then maybe I'll say, well, I'll find room. But generally, you know, if I'm hungry, I'm going to stop at the taco truck. If I'm not hungry, I'm not going to stop at the taco truck. So that's the way this if statement is going to work here. So as we're going through our code, we get here. If we're hungry, we do this. If we're not, we don't. We just keep going. So that's the simplest form of an if statement. You have a condition. If the condition is true, you do this thing. If the condition's not true, you skip it. Okay. Let's expand this a little bit. So let's say I'm driving down the road, I see the taco truck, and I am hungry. So then I check my wallet. And I'm going to see, you know, do I have enough cash in my wallet to make a stop at the taco truck? Let's rewrite this here. So if because all the good taco trucks only take cash. So if my cash is greater than or equal to five dollars, so that's all I need to get plenty of tacos at the best taco trucks. Cash is greater than or equal to five dollars. I'm going to the taco truck. But if I don't have five bucks, going home, eating a frozen pizza. So in the first example, if my condition was true, I did the activity and then that was it. But if the condition wasn't true, then I just skipped the activity. Now, with this example, if my condition is true, I do an activity, but if my condition is not true, I do some different activity. So now we have a choice for, for true or for false. So if, if my condition is true, I eat the tacos. If my condition is false, I go home for a frozen pizza. So again, before the earlier example, if the condition was true, I ate the tacos. If the condition was false, I did not eat the tacos. That was it. But now I have a second option here. So now, if I get to the taco truck and I have 
five bucks, I'm going to stop at the taco truck. But if I get to the taco truck and I don't have five bucks, I'm going to keep driving, go home and eat my frozen pizza instead. Now, the way this is going to work here, you're not going to do both of these. So if I'm eating tacos, if I do have the cash and I get the tacos, if I eat tacos, I'm not then going to go home and also eat the frozen pizza. It's one or the other here. Either I'm eating tacos or I'm eating frozen pizza, but I'm not doing both. That's not, that's not what this statement set up to do. So let's say I'm driving along and I see this food court and I'm really hungry, so I'm going to stop in the food court and it's got a bunch of different things in there. Um, and you know, it's a food court I've been to before. I know what's in there and I know what's, you know, I have an idea of what I want. So let's say there's a taco truck in there. We'll stick with that part of the example. So let's say that's my first choice. I know that's the absolute best thing in this entire food court is the taco truck. So if the taco truck is open, that's what I'm going for. But let's say the taco truck's not open, which is a bummer because that's what I really wanted. But I know that the shawarma stand in there is really good too. So what I'll do is if the taco truck's not open, then I'll go check and see about the shawarma stand. So if the shawarma stand's open, then I'll eat that. I'll be pretty happy with that situation too. So let's say the shawarma stand's also closed. So then I'm going to check the next thing. So the next thing is going to be the sushi stand. So I'll check and see if the, if the sushi's open. If that's the case, then that's what I'll have. But if the sushi stand's closed, well, I know the rest of the food court's pretty much garbage, but there's a burger stand in there that's decent and it's always open. So I'll go to that. So what we've done here is we've set up a list in order of preference. So the way this works is it's going to check each condition one at a time. As soon as it finds one of these conditions, we have with the if or the else if, as soon as it finds one condition that's true, it's going to do that activity and then it's done. So if I walk into this food court and I go to the taco truck and the taco truck's open, I'm going to eat the tacos. And then that's it. I'll eat tacos and then I'm done. I'm not going to go eat tacos and then go eat shawarma and then go eat sushi and then go eat burgers. I'm not doing all of these things. I'm only doing one. I'm doing the first one that's true. So if the tacos is not open, then I'm gonna, only then am I going to bother checking the shawarmas. So you know, if I walked into this food court looking for tacos and the tacos are open, I'm going to get my tacos and I'm going to go home. I'm not going to go check. I'm not going to get my tacos and then go check on the shawarma and then check on the sushi and everything. I don't really care. I got what I wanted. I'm eating my dinner. I don't need to check all the other stands. <clears throat> But if the tacos was closed, then I'd go check on the shawarma to see if it's open because I'm still hungry. I didn't get my tacos, but I do still want something. So only then, only if the ta only if tacos is not open, will I check shawarma. But I'm still not checking sushi. If the shawarma is open, I'm going to get the shawarma and take that for dinner. But I'm not going to go bother looking into the sushi. Only if both the tacos and the shawarma are closed, am I going to look into the sushi. And then as far as the burgers are concerned, I'm not looking at the burgers at all either, unless everything else is closed. So the, the hamburgers is my default activity. If nothing else is available, I'm going for the hamburgers. And I don't even need to put a condition here with else. So with else if, you need a condition. But with else, else is just referring to all conditions, any other condition besides the ones we've already checked. So 
So let's say in this food court, there's in addition to tacos, ramen, sushi, and burgers, maybe there's also um, you know, a cold sandwich stand, and maybe there's a, a Indian food stand. And while I love Indian food, the last time I tried this place, it didn't go well. So I'm never going there again. So all this stuff is in there. So, but if the tacos are closed, the shawarma is closed, the sushi is closed, even if the Indian's open and the sandwich place is open, I don't like those places, so I'm going to the burgers. So whatever other conditions going on besides the ones that I've looked at, that's what fits in here. And you don't even need to write it because else automatically refers to all conditions that you haven't already checked or you haven't already eliminated. So you don't have to write anything in there. Okay, so just to kind of repeat here with if and else if. The first condition that's true is the one that you go for. And you don't, you don't go for any of the others after that. So, um, so you go through the list until you find the first condition that's true. Then you do the activity and then you stop. So like I said, if I get the shawarma, that's it. I do shawarma and then I'm done. I don't check anything else. Shawarma is closed, then I'll check sushi. Only if all of these that are listed are closed do I go for my default. So let's go for our general example here. I'll write out what this would look like. There's no space between else and if, by the way. This is all one word. OK. So with your ifs, your else ifs, your else and your end, you can have as many else ifs as you want. You can have one, you can have three, you can have 40. You can have as many else ifs as, as you want. If you are going to this crazy food court that's got 50 different restaurants and you want to put them in order of preference, you can. You can have 50 else ifs. So you can have as many of those as you want. But in general, all if statements are required to have if and end. So those are required. Everything else is optional. So the if and end are option or required. You must have an if, you must have a first condition, and you must have a first activity, and you must have an end. But everything else is optional. With the else ifs, you can have as many as you want. With else, you only get one. And again, it's optional, and it's always last. It's always last. And you do not specify a condition with else.
You don't need to specify a condition with else because else refers to all conditions that you haven't already specifically dealt with. All conditions you haven't explicitly specified. That's really the long and short of if statements. Um, so obviously this food truck example, you can't punch that into MATLAB and have it do anything. That's more of a conceptual example that I wanted to show you in order to kind of put all this together. So let me put together a little example, just using numbers, something you can actually do in MATLAB to kind of see how it works. We'll have an if statement. If x is greater than 0, we are going to take our x value, and we're going to add 10 to it and just overwrite x. So if x is greater than 0, we're going to take Take that x value, add 10, overwrite x. Otherwise, if x is not greater than 0, if x is less than 0, now we don't want any negative numbers. So we're going to reset x to 0. 0 is going to be our minimum value. OK, so so far, what values of x have we looked at? We've looked at all positive values of x. We've looked at all negative values of x. We've missed exactly one value of x. So rather than explicitly state it, that one value of x we've missed is x equals 0. We don't need to explicitly state it, though, because there are an infinite number of values of x. Uh, some of them are positive. Some of them are negative. One of them is 0. We've covered all the ones that are positive, all the ones that are negative. Now we're just left with the zero. We don't need to actually state it. If our x value is equal to zero, we're going to go ahead and just set it to 100. OK, so that's our, that's a, a quick example. So let's say before we get here, somewhere in our code, we either calculate or set x equal to 24. So if x equals 24, that's greater than 0. So then we're going to take x, which is 24, add 10 to it. Now it's 34. Save it back into x. By the time we get done with all this, x is going to equal 34. Because again, we're not going to check any of these other, um, we already checked x greater than 0. So we do this, and then we're done. We don't even need to think about the rest of it. OK, let's say instead of x being equal to 24, x was equal to negative 24. So x is not greater than 0. So we're not going to do this. We're going to check the next condition. x is less than 0. x is negative 24. That's less than 0. So we're going to take x, and we're going to reset it to 0. And then we're done. So x is 0. OK. So one more time, let's say x is equal to 0. So it's not greater than 0, so we're not doing this. It's not less than 0, so we're not doing this. That means we're going to fall into our default, because it's not any of these two, so it must fall in here. So we're going to take x, and we're going to set it to 100. So here's your mission. So you're going to write a MATLAB program. First thing I want you to do, use the input command to ask the user for a number. Second thing. Find out if that number is positive, negative, or zero. And the third thing, print the result on the screen. So print on the screen whether it's positive, negative, or zero.
So the, the code for putting this together is mostly already right here on the whiteboard. So um, we've already got the part that's going to differentiate between positive, negative, and zero. We just need to really fill in the activities. So in this case, instead of adding 10 or setting something to zero or setting something to 100, we're just going to print on the screen what the values are. So first thing, we're going to uh, we're going to get the value from the user. So we'll call it x. We can call it whatever we want, but I'll call it x for now. So x is going to equal something from our input command. So use input. Okay, just a reminder, when you use the input command, when you hit run, your prompt is going to show up in your command window and MATLAB is going to sit there and wait until you answer the question. If you do not answer the question, it's going to keep waiting. If you hit run again while it's waiting, it's just going to line up another instance of your program and it's going to wait for you to answer the question for that too. So you keep hitting run, it's going to keep waiting until you finally answer your question. Once that happens, now you're going to have to answer the question once for each time you hit the, hit the run button. So hit the run button once and answer your own questions. And then, um, then we're not running into this very common problem. OK, so we got our number. Now we have an x value. Now we're going to go through and figure out uh, whether it's positive, negative, or 0. So here's how we'll do that. So if x is greater than zero, we can just display on the screen it's positive. Now here, you can change around the order that you do things in. You can check. So really, we're just going to check. We have three conditions that we want to evaluate here. We have positive, negative, or zero. We only need to check two, because once we eliminate two of those conditions, the number must be the third one, because it can only fall into one of those three positions. So I'm actually going to check if x is equal to zero. Those are really the only things I have to do. And again, you can, instead of checking x equals 0, you could check x less than 0 and put your display a negative in here. You can switch these up however you want. You're only, you only need to check two of the three conditions, and then else will cover the third one. So now if we hit run, it should ask us our number here. Give me a number, any number. Again. Don't go hitting run a second time. Actually watch your command window and look for the prompt. Without that, if you don't answer it, now we're going to get ourselves into a loop here. So I'm going to go ahead and answer my question. Now, what I want to do when I test a program like this is I want to check all three of these conditions. I want to be able to make sure that a positive number registers positive, negative registers negative, and zero registers zero. So I'm going to try each of these first. I'll try zero first. So that's good. It tells me it's zero. That's a good first test. But we want to keep trying. We want to make sure that if I have a positive number, it doesn't try to tell me it's zero also. So I'll try a positive number. Try six. And we get positive. So that's good. Now we'll try a negative number. We'll try a negative nine. Negative. So our program appears to be working OK. I'm going to show you. I already kind of went through this, but I'm going to go through it again with the round command. And then I've got a second activity for you to do using that round command. So we'll switch over to the whiteboard. We'll take a look at that, and then we'll go back to activity. The round command 
takes whatever's inside the parentheses here and rounds it to the nearest whole number. So this can be useful for a number of things. Uh, one of them is we can use it to check if a number is a whole number or check if it's an integer. There's another way to say that. So you can take that number, let's say our number is x. If you take round x, this will round it to the nearest whole number. If it's already a whole number, nothing's going to change. So if you take 8 and round it to the nearest whole number, it's going to be 8. But if you take 7.5 and round it to the nearest whole number, that's also going to be 8. So we can check if a number is an integer by rounding it to the nearest whole number and comparing it with itself. So if it's a whole number, these will be equal, right? If x is 8, you round it to the nearest whole number, that's 8. That's still equal to 8. Another thing we can do is check divisibility. That's the one we did earlier. We can check if a number is divisible by 2. Or another way to say that is if it's even. So again, if you take an even number, divide it by 2. So let's say 8 again. If you take 8 divided by 2, that's 4. If you take 4 and round it to the nearest whole number, it's 4. So in that case, x over 2 is going to be the same as rounded x over 2. But if you have an odd number, say 7, you divide that by 2, it's 3.5. If you round 3.5 to the nearest whole number, it's 4. 4 is not equal to 3.5. So we can use this check to see if the number is even. Now, this is not the only way to check that kind of stuff in MATLAB or computer programming. In fact, the round command is something you'll find in MATLAB and not in ne not necessarily in other languages. So, um, at least not directly. So that's going to kind of lead me to the next activity. Um, so you're going to write another MATLAB program. The first thing, ask user for input. But ask user for a whole number. But we're not going to trust our user to actually listen and give us a whole number. We're going to check. So we're going to check and see if the number is an integer. If it is, then we're going to continue. So if yes, find out if it's odd or even. And then print on the screen. OK, so that's the, the new mission here. The first thing we wanted to do um, is ask our user for an input. So so we'll ask for a whole number. This will kind of encourage the user to give us a whole number rather than um, try to break our code. But you never know who your user is. Maybe they'll try to break your code anyway. So the first thing we'll do then is we're going to check and see if that number is a whole number. So if it's not a whole number, we're going to have an error message. So if x is not equal to round x, that means it's not a whole number. And so we'll, we'll throw an error. 
So I'm using the error command. What the error command does is it will kill the program and it will uh, print an error message so that we know what happened. It's what's called a fatal error. Kind of a uh, harsh term, but that's just what they call it. Okay, but so if our if our number is not a whole number, we'll throw an error. Otherwise, we will get to work here and we'll start checking to see if it's odd or even. So first we'll check even. Well, really, we're only going to check even. So if it is, uh, we round x divided by 2 and it equals x divided by 2 not rounded, then we have an even number. So I'll use f print f to do this one. just for fun. Okay, so that's how we'll check for if it's even. If it's not even, then it must be odd. So we've already eliminated in our first if statement, we eliminated any non whole numbers. So if we get here now, if it's an even number, we print that if it's still not even, then it's odd. So we can just go straight to our um, uh, straight to our statement for if, it, if it's odd. We don't need to check in any other condition here. And that really should do, that should do it. That should be everything here. So pretty similar codes between our plus minus code and our odd even code. We just did some slightly different checks in our if statements and then printed slightly different things. But the setup is basically the same. So if we hit run, we can try each value here. So we can first try our error and make sure that it works. So let's pro provide a not whole number. I'll give it 4.2, hit enter. And I should get my error message. It's my own error message, the one I wrote. I said a whole number. So that's kind of, that's what the error command will do. It tells you where the error occurred and what the error message is. And it prints it in red and kills the program. Let's try numbers that work. So we'll hit run. And we're going to provide an even number. So six is an even number. Yes, it is. We'll try an odd number. Five is an odd number. So our program seems to be giving us proper answers. We could try a negative just to make sure. So negative six is even. Negative 23 should be odd, and it is. So it seems like our program is working just fine. 